and as a party, we believe that uh, whatever we do, we must uh, let the presence of God be felt in our midst in all that we do. And so one of the major engagements that we have decided to do is to uh, have an interaction with the Christian community. Uh, we have already met the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the moderator and his team. Uh, today, we have the privilege and honor of meeting the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council. I think in a few days or weeks to come, we'll be meeting the Cali Secretariat, all in our bid to uh, have broader consultation because very soon, uh, we've begun the processes towards building our manifesto. And in governance systems now, uh, non-state actors like religious organizations have a very critical role to play in the governance architecture of our country. And so we believe that uh, we need to start engaging and in doing so also uh, let you into what we have for the nation and try and elicit your support and direction as we move forward. That is why uh, this engagement has become one of the top priorities of our programs. And so this morning we are here with the leader of our team and the presidential candidate of our party. Um, we all know that um, our constitution uh, guarantees uh, religious freedom and freedom of worship and the right to express one's uh, religious uh, uh, beliefs. And uh, we've all upheld that uh, since the 1992 Constitution uh, came into being. Um, the faith-based organizations um, are a very critical partner in national development because you're concerned not only with the spiritual upliftment of the members of our congregation, but also their material existence. And as churches, I'm sure that you have to deal with issues of poverty, and I mean issues of you know um, human crisis, both in a family setting and in other settings, that are influenced by how the country is run, and so you cannot not be a stakeholder in good governance and in the development and prosperity of of the country, and so it is important that at any time the church, let me use the church for uh, simplicity. It's important that at any time the church is in tune with issues that are boil, uh, bubbling up in the course of our governance uh, uh, of our country. And so the church must be in touch with governments in order that it understands policy uh, implementation that government is undertaking. But at the same time, the church should also be in tune with the minority so that it understands the issues that the minority uh, raises and be able to uh, see a clear pathway as to which direction the nation should, should go. The church is the moral conscience of our nation. And I've always said in many cases, for us in the political domain, we become steeped in the values and the issues in, that we believe in. And so sometimes we're on a tangent that probably might not be in the best interest. It is the moral conscience that will call us and say, no, we don't think this is the way to go. We think that you should rather look, look at this. In our traditional parlance, they say that the one who is clearing the path does not know when the path is becoming crooked. It is the one standing and watching who can tell that the path is not as straight as uh, it should be. And so we'll always value interactions like this with you because then it gives us an opportunity for you to understand the viewpoint from which we also come. Um, the way we're trying to structure this discussion is that there are few issues of interest to us, and I'm sure they might be of interest to you. The, few issue, the first issue has to do with um, education. I think that education is a very important um, sector of human development because it is education that produces the human resource that is necessary for um, any country to develop. So every country takes education seriously. And in Ghana, if you consider that we spend more than 30% of total national budget on education alone, then it means that that investment must be worth uh, something. And so there are many issues that um, are bubbling up, you know, from the education sector. I think that every country, after a while, tries to reform its education to bring it abreast with 
um, current developments, not only in the national arena, but in the world arena. From when we were kids growing up, all our parents wanted to put us in grammar school so that we could speak very good English and we could be eloquent uh, public speakers and all that. And um, that was the kind of education. I mean, to be very eloquent in public was seen as a mark of scholarship. You know, that has all changed. Um, it's no longer how long your English is, you know, but what you use your education for, applied education, that is important. And with the current state of national development and world events, um, it looks like technical and vocational training is becoming even more critical because it is in that sector of national development that new jobs are being thrown out, new skills in, in terms of IT, in terms of service pro pro provision, and so on and so forth. And so we need to be looking at our educational structure and reforming it to match the developing trends, you know, not only in our country, but in, in the rest of the, of the world. And that is why the curriculum of education becomes very important. And so recently government has embarked on reforming the curriculum. And there was an attempt to take out some subjects, bring in some subjects, but that's an issue I'll leave to uh, our member of parliament, parliament here uh, to, to raise. But we believe that in reforming the education system, there must be a new clear pathway that takes children in the different areas of socialization that they want to go. And so if children have a flair for technical and vocational training, right from GSS through the uh, secondary path, they must begin to find their way towards technical and vocational education. And it must be branded as being equal to the normal secondary education. Right now, the perception we have about people who go to technical school is that they are dropouts and that they were not as good as those of us who went through the secondary stream and went into education, into sec, uh, tertiary education. But that should not be the case. A child must choose the technical vocational path because he has an aptitude for it and because he can gain a certain proficiency in it that makes him ready for the world of work. And so these are some of the things we are looking at. We have an education policy working group and we're going to inaugurate our policy working groups on the 24th of this month. And when we do that, they're going to meet the different interest group. It's going to be a dialogue with the people. And so we'll meet Utag, we'll meet Nagrat, we'll meet um, the uh, uh, Tewu, and all the other stakeholders in the educational sector so that we can begin to formulate policy up as to how to make our education you know, uh, more proactive and more profitable for this nation than it currently is. I've spoken about free SHS you know, several times, and I'm sure that all of you have been following the debate on free SHS. There's no question about free SHS between the two parties. Before the last election, we all said, yes, free SHS is a constitutional provision, and all of us will work on it. Actually, we started because we removed fees for day students. And so before we left office, day students were not paying uh, any fees if you were in a public school. And what we did was to begin to expand it to cover boarding students, but starting with the most deprived areas where poverty is endemic. And so we chose 40 districts in this country that are the poorest districts. And then we started to recruit the children from the poorest families to give them bursaries so that they could have a free education. Well, the 2016 election took place, NPP won, and they decided that they were going to implement it within a three-year period. And so they've done it, but it's come with some difficulties, and that's how come the double track and things have come. One, you need infrastructure, enough infrastructure. And that's why we said, let's build 200 new secondary schools so that when the influx of children comes, there'll be enough space to accommodate uh, all of them. And so as you expand infrastructure, you make sure you have dormitories, you have classroom blocks, you have laboratories, you train more teachers and put more teachers in the school. Then you can open it up and then as more children come, you have enough facilities to make sure that you don't compromise uh, quality. Unfortunately, um, government decided that they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And so they implemented it as it, it is. Then the fallout started coming. And then we said, oh, let's hold a stakeholder consultation. Because um, 
let's all come, bring parents, bring educational experts, bring religious leaders, everybody, and let's sit and look at the issues coming up and see how we can resolve them. Government says no, they will do it themselves. So they come up with double track, which has its own headaches. Children come and stay at home for three months, and the others go three months, and then when they come back, these ones go, these ones come. They are asking teachers in the new academic year to teach from morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. Longer hours because they want to make up for the time that the children stay at home. And so it's putting stress on the teachers, it's putting stress on the students. Textbooks are not available. There are many things that we could have used money to improve quality, but because it's all going into the best rate system, you know, to make sure that we're able to get that for 1.9, almost 1.9 million students, then there's no money left for training of teachers, for provision of learning aids, and so on and so forth. So those are the issues that we have been uh, raising, and we thought that you should understand them. The next issue is something that is on the minds of all of us, and that is the issue of uh, corruption. I think that corruption has become very topical, and it is a matter that worries the church very much. It pervades every sector of our, our, our lives, and it is a canker that is very difficult to deal with. Um, I'm sure that even within the church, we have issues like that that come up, and um, it's something that we must never get tired of fighting. Um, Working with the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, we came out with several pieces of code of conduct for public officers and so many other things, and um, all in a, an effort in the fight against corruption. There are also several pieces of legislation that we have passed, whistleblowers bill, you know, financial administration regulations, uh, public procurement bill, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to legislation, we have no shortage of legislation to deal with corruption. The laws are there, they are good, they are best practice, you compare them to laws across uh, the world. Ghana has some of the best laws in terms of the fight against corruption. But like I've always said, laws themselves don't get up and, 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 and go and fight corruption. They have to be applied. And when they have to be applied, then human discretion uh, comes in, and that's where the, the problem is. So there are three facets you must consider in the fight against corruption. The first is to put in the right uh, enabling environment f using legislation. Then the second is uh, to prevent it, issue of prevention. And so you must put in mechanisms that reduce human discretion to be able to engage in corruption. And then you must also have public awareness and education so that people understand what actually corruption practices are. Unfortunately, we have some of our traditional practices that are on the borderline of corruption. Giving gifts and things is something that traditionally we do in traditional practice. You go to a chief's palace and you have to give them money and drinks, you know, but that's customary. So even in our own traditions, we have these things that are on the border between what is customary and traditional and what is actually corruption. So putting in preventive measures and also creating public awareness about what you should do and not do in the form of various code of conduct and all that kind of thing are things that are useful. But the final one is uh, sanctions. That is when people have, it's, that, it's not that corruption will not occur, you'll always have people who are deviants, but when it has occurred, how do you deal with it? And that is where leadership becomes uh, important, how you deal, you know, frontally uh, with, with, co with corruption. So, every day, Auditor General's report comes out, and this person has misappropriated this, this person has misappropriated that. Happily, we have an Auditor General who has come, who seems very firm in terms of dealing. He's brought the issue of surcharges and so on and so forth to be able to retrieve monies that have been misappropriated, you know, from uh, public funds and all that. And I think that he must continue to be encouraged to go on that track. But there are other issues that come up in terms of, you know, corruption scandals and things. And how we deal with them are what make the difference. So when you are in government, you know, the police will just serve the interest of government. And then the opposition will cry foul. When the tables turn, 
is the same situation. We have witnessed it for the past 20 something years of our democratic rule. Why can't we, since we've all tasted power in and out of government, deal with this canker? It is said if the tree, the root of the tree is bad, the fruit would be bad. And so why can't we start addressing and to strengthen our um, institutions to ensure that the police can work without fear or favor? Some of the other institutions can be well strengthened. What is it that we are afraid of? that for the sake of our democracy to enhance good governance, we can't strengthen our institutions. And I think this is something that we will want wonderful people like you to start thinking about because it's a major concern of, of, the, of the citizenry. Um, there is the need to definitely build a more vocational institutions and that is the bedrock of any development. And so that is something that should interest us. The idea of the 40 years national development, uh, from where I come from and the work I do in vision development um, as an authority in that area, I think is the key to our democracy that in the next 30 years, um, if, the, if the university professors have an idea where Ghana can be in the next 10 years, 20 years, they can prepare the kind of students that can meet into that future. And of course, if house old people, families are aware that in the next 20 years, this is where Ghana would be. It will give us an idea. Based upon most of the things we have taught, I've realized that if you ask the average politician in the next 10 years, where would Ghana be? They wouldn't be able to tell you. You know, parliament wouldn't tell you in the next 20 years where Ghana would be. You know, politicians would not be able to predict where Ghana would be. And without vision, you are not going anywhere. And so that is something that we should definitely trumpet. As religious leaders, we should understand that politics determine where you can be born. Politics determine the school you will attend to. Politics determine where you can marry. Politics determine the kind of a, um, job you would have. Politics determine the kind of hospital you can have good access of health. Politics determine life after 60 when you are you, you have pension. Politics even determine where you can be buried. In other words, from life, from birth to death, it's all about politics. And if we can get involved, then it is disaster for our national development. Everything about our lives from birth to death is politics. Not partisan politics, but politics. Because it involves policy. And therefore, we should be much more involved in our national development. And I trust that we will commit ourselves to that process. And I want to thank our honorable members of the NDC for making the time to come to have interaction with us. I also want to thank our GPCC leaders for making the time. We trust that going forward, we will put Ghana above other things. Because at the end of the day, what happens after generation yet unborn. The decisions we take today will be affecting the next generation. May God help all of us that together we can build the Ghana we desire to see. Thank you very much.